This is Patrick Fischler. I've appeared on TV shows such as Mad Men, Lost, and Weeds. I actually have a real career. So what the heck am I doing on Mr. Media Radio with Bob Andelman? Somebody get my agent on the phone right now. Today, I'll welcome Keith Elliott Greenberg, author of the moving, fascinating new book, December 8th, 1980, The Day John Lennon Died. Stick around. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media show right on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free app at www.stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? Would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is Mr. Media Interview. You know, Mr. Media, mrmedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 600 archives, interviews, for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by PartyAuthority.us. Planning a wedding, this corporate, on all occasions, call the party by and dial DJs. 1-800-342-5357, where one call does it all. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of mop top senior citizens telling, retelling, and telling, and retelling their story in the Beatles live on Ed in the new new media capital of the world, and home of the 2010 American League East champions, Tampa Bay Rays, St. Petersburg, Florida. There's certain days in all of our lives we can't help but remember. I was sitting at the desk in Petersburg with the Today Show on in the background when the first plane flew into the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. I was in my kitchen in Gainesville, Florida on March 5, 1982, when my friend Jim Doton called from a payphone to say he just heard that John Belushi died. Jim was on his way up from Miami for a visit with a cooler full of fear. That's what I remember. And I was in another Gainesville apartment 15 months earlier, on December 8, 1980, studying in my bedroom when one of my roommates, Andy Anderson, opened the door and said, Hey, I died. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. My guy, Tom, ever died? Well, for some reason, Andy connected me with John Lennon uh, when the Monday Night Football game that he and our third roommate, Cesar Quintana, by they were watching, it was interrupted by how cells announced that the Beatles Lennon had been shot outside his home city. My my actual only connection, and this is pretty peripheral, to John Lennon was that we shared a birthday, October 9th. Of course, Lennon was born in 1940. I came along 20 years later. And my first Beatles album, Meet the Beatles, was actually the second LP my parents bought for me at our neighborhood drugstore back in Somerset, New Jersey. The first was the headquarters. I still have both discs. Now, like people shocked and horrified that some jackass named Mark David Chapman ran away from us, it was incredibly wrong in many levels. About 30 years, I can't say I was eager to read a book that might potentially glorify Chapman. That's not the book that Keith Daly Greenberg, December 8, 1980, that John Lennon died, is an amazing dissection of people and events on that instant day. It does not justify Chapman's action, but it does explain what was in his head in the days and weeks leading up to the shooting. The depth, the depth and the detail is remarkable. It's the kind of history that you just can't put down. And Greenberg brings an interesting uh, background to this. In addition to writing books and magazine articles uh, for Maxim, uh, The Village Voice, and New York Observer over the years, uh, among others, he's also a producer is most wanted. Kelly Greenberg, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, can I ask you, and of all the subjects for a book, uh, what drew you to this one? I mean, 
and nearly decline the review copy alone just as a matter of propriety. And you know what? That's that's a very interesting point that you make. There are Beatles fans out there who won't even say Mark David Chapman's name aloud. And I, I can sympathize with them. It's similar to when I've interviewed a crime victim while working for America's Most Wanted, and they refuse to utter the name of their child's killer you know, under their roof. Uh, I guess they look at their relationship with John Lennon as something sacrosanct, and um, the name of Mark David Chapman sullies it. Unfortunately, Mark David Chapman is part of the narrative, and uh, just as Lee Harvey Oswald is part of the John F. Kennedy narrative, and this story really isn't about Mark David Chapman. It is about John Lennon, it is about his relationship with his fans, and it is about um, the communal mourning I think we all share. I think it's interesting that you said something in your introduction, how you remember exactly where you were that day. And in the course of my life as a reporter, when the December 8th, 1980 comes up, it doesn't matter if I'm talking to a former mobster or I'm talking to a homeless guy on the street or I'm talking to a professional musician. Everyone remembers where they were on December 8th, 1980. Mm-hmm. Well, I was, and yeah, I mean, I, I, ranked, uh, I ranked that day uh, alongside 9-11 in impact on my life, mostly because it... Yeah, I mean, it was John Lennon, it was a Beatle. It was just one of those crimes, one of those things that happens that is so unexpected, so horrifying, that you just can't, you can't make sense of it. And, and you know, it's one person's life versus 3,000 on, on 9-11 and, and all the millions who were impacted by what happened there. But a lot of people were impacted by this, and it's just so senseless. Yeah, a lot of people were impacted by this, and I would never demean the memories of the people of, from 9-11 to compare you know, 3,000 deaths to the death of one. But the resonance is comparable. And, um, you know, I was in New York on both days. And on both days, my reaction, my initial reaction was very similar. It was um, disbelief. I couldn't fully conceive what had occurred. Um, on uh, December 8th, I was not much older than you, or I think maybe I'm a year older than you, or I was with two friends, not unlike you. And when a buddy of mine turned on the news, I just didn't really believe that John Lennon was hurt that badly. I just couldn't you know, wrap my head around that. Just as on 9-11, when the planes hit, I watched it on TV. I was just a few miles away. And I just didn't really understand that there were all those people trapped in that building. I was almost it – was, it was literally being in shock. Well, as you thought about doing this, uh, is it that you thought that there was an untold story of Mark David Chapman and, and the events of the day or – or was it, you know, is it just... Enough? It's not the story of Mark David Chapman. Mark David Chapman, uh, you know, is, is a player in the story. It's really a story of us. I'm a New Yorker, and I felt uh, John Lennon's impact, very, the, the death of John Lennon very strongly, the impact of John's death very strongly, because uh, John had chosen to become a New Yorker himself, and he was a real New Yorker. He had contributed money to the Police Benevolent Association. He shopped at local businesses. His child played with other children in the building. He was, uh, he, he was gracious to his fans when they approached him. And, um, you know, he, he could have lived anywhere in the world. He lived in New York. And in many ways, uh, December 8th, 1980, the day John Lennon died, is a story of New York City on that day. What were the issues that morning? Ronald Reagan was in New York. He had just been elected president. He was having lunch with his son, who had just gotten married and uh, with, without inviting uh, the, the, pres- the uh, president-elect of the first lady. Nancy Reagan wasn't even coming to the lunch. Mayor Koch, who I interviewed for the book, was under fire for uh, closing a hospital in Harlem, and he was being called a racist. Um, and the police officer who, who was one of the first officers at the scene 
was driving to work that morning. He had covered the Beatles when they came to Shea Stadium in 1965, and uh, never realizing that that night, John Lennon would be another part of his story. He'd be the first officer on the scene after John Lennon was killed. So it's a story of what the famous and the anonymous were all doing that day and how it all converged. And the one thing about the story is the reader knows what's going to happen. The people in the story do not know what's going to happen. And that was my point of departure, that I was trying to create the sense of what it was like to be walking that day, not realizing that that axe was going to fall. Uh, how did you... Uh a minute, but how did you decide, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's the naked city, it's Gotham, there's millions of people who were affected, um, big names, small names. How did you settle on the, the handful of people whose tales that you told from that day? Were they people that you found in, in clips and went back and looked up, or did you know any of these people? How did you find them? I, I, I knew quite a few of them. Um, once the ball started rolling, more people came forward. Um, once I spoke to the former mayor at Koch, obviously he opened a couple of doors for me. Um, I'm a reporter. I know other reporters. A good deal of the book is dedicated to um, a day in the life of those reporters who ended up covering the story. Uh, um, and also, you know, we're on the Internet right now. There was no Internet back then. Reporters called in their story by payphone. Um, a bunch of reporters from the New York Post were drinking in a bar called the Lion's Head when the news hit, and they're fighting over the payphone to call their sources. The guy from the New York Daily News finds a friend who's also a reporter who lives near Lennon's house, and they take turns reporting and going upstairs to uh, call their newspapers. A, um, a, a um, news director, assistant news director at um, the local ABC affiliate was in the emergency room when John Lennon was wheeled in and his instincts as a reporter kicked in and he was hopping with a broken leg across the emergency room to try to get to a phone to inform his desk that this watershed event had occurred. Now that I got to I got to I got to say that was great color great detail. I I'm assuming that's someone you know or you were introduced to by someone well, we else. have a mutual friend. Ah uh. And then that was, once I loved that. I mean, I I hated it, but I loved it. You know what I mean? It's one of those I, things. Yeah, and everyone like, says that I, I hated it, but yeah. I loved it, and that's how I felt. Because he describes what John Lennon looked when he was dead. I mean, while he was laying there on that table, he looks in and he sees John Lennon with his chest open, and the doctors have given up. And it's a horrible, horrible moment, and it's not really an image I want to have in my head. But sadly, that's part of the story too. And that's you know, that's what victims look like, and that's what Mark David Chapman did to John Lennon. Um, have you had any feedback from either Yoko's camp or or from uh, John Sons or any of the surviving Beatles about this book, or is it too uh, soon? I think it's too soon. I mean, technically, the release date is November 1st, although I've seen the book already. And um, in one bookstore in Brooklyn, a friend of mine told me she picked up the book at a bookstore in Manhattan. So I guess some copies of the book are out there, but it is too early. The only feedback I've been getting is from other reporters like yourself who've read the book. Mm, okay. Yeah, so that's, that, that's, that's yet ahead. Um, look, we, we're going to take a, a quick 20-second uh, break. When we come back, I do want to talk to you about Chapman because I think that's some of the most interesting stuff in the book for a lot of reasons. So um, we'll take a quick, a quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Keith Elliott Greenberg, author of December 8, 1980, The Day John Lennon Died. And we'll be right back. Ever thought of hosting your own radio show? Now you can by registering at blogtalkradio.com. While you're there, check out our selection of premium packages. To start your own show today, visit blogtalkradio.com. Hi, this is uh, Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Keith Elliott Greenberg, author of December 8, 1980, The Day John Lennon Died. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about Mark David Chapman. Um, what I think a lot of people will be drawn to in this book, besides the 
the other detail, other people whose lives were impacted and what was going on in their lives, including great detail about what John and Yoko were doing throughout the day from the, photo, the infamous photo shoot, the studio, everything else. Um, the stuff about Chapman was very interesting to me. I never, never have had any desire to learn any more about this guy. Uh, I, I didn't care what motivated him. I, I just thought he was an asshole. It didn't matter. But reading the book, you have, uh, you have gone in and... Um, You've gotten incredible detail. I forgot about the Larry King interview. My God, how, what, a, what a horrific thing that was. Uh, what did you find that may be fresh to his story, or is it just that it's a way I, I, I don't know if it's fresh know. to his story so much as just compiling all those different interviews he's done, along with his statements at the various parole hearings. He comes up for parole hearings every two years. And at every one of those hearings, he makes a statement. And just looking at all of those statements and stringing them together into a narrative was pretty fascinating. And although he expresses remorse, I really do not trust what's coming out of his mouth because he also seems to be somewhat excited. When he's expressing remorse, he talks about that great impact that he had on John Lennon's fans and on Yoko Ono, and he seems to be uh, relishing in the credit that he's taken for changing uh, pop culture history. Um, I do think he's mentally ill. Um, I think he's delusional. I think he's found a way to cope behind bars, maybe because things are regimented. He's told to A, B, C. He's isolated from the other inmates. He's not getting into confrontations. But I don't know, Bob. Do you, would you trust having him uh, walking the streets again? No, no, no without, a, without a doubt, no. And the fact that all this happened 30 years ago doesn't really change in my mind. I, yeah, I mean, this guy... Uh, I, look, there's no doubt in my mind, mentally ill. This, is, this seems to be a quite clear-cut case where the, the insanity laws and mental, mental illness seem to really fit this guy. But that doesn't mean he should be out there on the street uh, recuperating uh, there. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, can you, can you, you know, Yoko Ono at the last uh, parole hearing, which was, uh, I believe, within the last month or, or two, she said, you know, she, she doesn't feel safe knowing that, he, that he'd be walking around out there. And, you know, I can put myself in her shoes. I mean, what is to stop him from doing something like that again if somebody's not monitoring every movement all day long? Hmm. Uh, let, me, let me ask you this. Do you think if, uh, if uh, Chapman had been drawn to a different Beatle, maybe, maybe McCartney, or maybe, maybe someone completely different, maybe uh, Robert Plant from Led Zeppelin, would the, would the cascade, would the effect on, on, on the public and people have been the same? You know, I, I mean, that, that, that's a good question. I think had he killed any Beatle, I think had he killed Ringo, yes. I think, well, you know, now, now you have my mind going there. I think that if he killed a Be- if a Beatle had been killed, this was before we even used the term stalkers. I think that um, the effect would have been fairly profound. The fact that John Lennon was such an advocate for so many causes and we followed his life uh, from the highs and the lows and he was just out there making his life public and that he was finally finding satisfaction in being a family man, um, it made it all the more tragic. However, you know, Paul McCartney was a really good family man and uh, certainly, you know, continues to have an impact, continues to make music on us. And I'm sure we would all be mourning the 30th anniversary as much as we're mourning uh, John Lennon's death right now. Mm. Yeah, there were two people who uh, I came away from the book feeling some sympathy for, and they're very different people. Um, one was uh, Mick Jagger, who you know talked a great anecdote and the way it's told about how the, you know the times that he would come by to try to get John to come out and, and hang out with him, and just spend time, and John just wouldn't do that. He just wasn't part of that. And I, I felt bad for Jagger because he was one of the people who made the effort to have John in his life, rather than you know I'm sure there's a lot of people who try to have Jagger in his life, and he you know he turns them away. But he you know, and I'm sure he has many mixed feelings about that, but also Chapman's wife. Me too. I felt the same way. 
Yeah, I felt the same way. I, I mean, and um, more so for her than for Mick Jagger. And, you know, I, I did a radio interview about two weeks back. And afterwards, the, the DJ and I were just kind of sitting around talking about who is Chapman's wife. I mean, she has remained with him. Uh, Chapman has had conjugal visits behind bars. Uh, she's a convert to Christianity. Um, she was from Japan, like Yoko Ono, which uh, talks about the pathology of Mark David Chapman. Um, and uh, I believe that she, uh, you know, believes in forgiveness as a, as, a, as a true Christian. And she has never walked away from her husband. So either she is an incredible human being or, uh, or a victim of some sort. Because he really did put her through hell. I mean, he was... He was coming. In, he came to New York. He returned to Hawaii to be with his wife. His wife thought, "Okay, I'm loving him. I'm doing the right thing. He's acting erratic. I'm saving him from his self-destructive tendencies." And then he got back on a plane and killed John Lennon. And here she is in her apartment while the reporters are banging down the door. Yeah. And how low does could a person's self-esteem be um, to stick with someone like that through all of this and 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 yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm not I'm not comfortable dealing with the Christian faith aspect of this because it, it's it's uh, it, it's a whole another uh, right. It's another realm, realm and it's, it, and this isn't this isn't the show for 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 us to discuss that type of thing. Um, I do but admire a, people yes. who you know I I do admire people who live by their philosophies. I've never you know read any interviews with her or discussed her, her particular faith with her. So, you know, I'm, I don't think we're in a position to comment on that. Now, you, you mentioned that uh, the description of uh, John uh, dead laid out on the stretcher uh, was, a, is, was not a pleasant one, obviously. Was there other material in, in, in the course of putting this book together that you found uh, distasteful or that you didn't want to deal with or that you you did not, or that maybe things things that you well, left out. Well, no, I mean, just reliving it was a little bit difficult. And I had a talk with a woman this morning, um, a, a blogger in Brooklyn where I live, um, who just read through the book, and she said, you know, towards the end of the book, you know, she remembered those feelings and um, what it felt like to know that John Lennon had been killed. And it, you know, it wasn't fun to relive that stuff and, you know, to know that he'd been snuffed out. And, I, you know, I was at the, the um, memorial in Central Park with 100,000 other uh, John Lennon fans. And, uh, you know, it was this prevailing feeling of, of sadness. And even though we were trying to create a feeling of unity – yeah, it felt lousy walking, getting back on the subway after that and knowing, okay, it's permanent. We've essentially buried John Lennon now. Hmm. I just, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and reading the book, I, I, you know, people listening to this, if you have an interest in this and maybe have avoided the uh, subject of Mark David Chapman or that day at all, uh, you'll find this book very interesting. It's It's worth... It's worth your time. It's worth your money. It's uh, not something I had ever intended to spend a lot of effort on, uh, not necessarily the book, but just, you know, the subject. And it's really fascinating. I mean, I really could not put it down uh, as I was going through it. So, uh, you know, uh, credit, to, credit to you, Keith. Um, so what are you, uh, what are you working on next? Well, um, you know, uh, uh, as you know, when you make your living in the media, Mr. Media, um, you have to uh, work hard because uh, the rewards are not always bountiful. So I have another true crime book uh, coming out in January from St. Martin's Press, another publisher, about a, a murder case down in um, rural Texas. And um, I'm uh, working on another true crime book as well out in California. And I have a full-time job. I work for America's Most Wanted, which is a challenging job and a satisfying job. And sadly, there are no shortage of victims out there seeking justice. True, true. Well, um, folks, listen, you can find Keith Elliott Greenberg's new book, December 8th, 1980, The Day John Lennon Died, in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price on mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Um, Keith, can, 
people find you? Is there a website for the book? Or are you on Twitter, Facebook? Any um, that kind of stuff? Well, I, I'm certainly on Facebook, and if anyone wants to friend me on Facebook, be my guest, because I feel if somebody uh, supports any of the books I've written, um, the least I can do is friend them on Facebook. I consider them a friend if they want to read something I've written. If they want to come to my house and, you know, hang out with my kids, I might be a little frightened. But uh, if they want to friend me on Facebook, that, that's quite all right. Uh, but, um, you know, all you have to do, if you type in December 8th, 1980, the day John Lennon died, plenty of things will come up. And um, I know Backbeat Books is um, – putting together a blog where people will be able to share their stories of that day and um, the, the publicist will I'm sure inform you uh, when that blog is launched and I think that'll be really great because then the community of John Lennon fans and mourners can, can relive it together and for those people too young enough to remember they can remember what it was like hmm. Well, um, Keith, uh, give our regards to, uh, I think, your editor, Mike Edison. Yeah, he's a great show. guy. Yeah. Yeah, and tell him I said hello. And uh, thanks so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. And, Bob, I really appreciate you uh, having patience with me. My schedule was running a bit late, but it was sure worth it. Thank you. My, my pleasure. Thanks for being with us, and good luck to you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Um, and, folks, if uh, you're interested in more original interviews with America's top uh, rock and roll and uh, political journalists and cr some crime journalists, too, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. And you can now hear Mr. Media while you're on the go with Stitcher Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile application. The latest episode of Mr. Media is always available for you. No syncing needed, no memory wasted. It's available for your iPhone, your Palm Pre, Android phones, or your BlackBerry. Downloading is easy. Just go to Stitcher.com or check out the App Store for your individual mobile phone. And please take advantage of this great offer from Mr. Media Radio listeners. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia for your free audiobook. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. While you're there, give us a review. Give us a few stars, you know. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or Twitter, twitter.com slash Andelman, or on Facebook, just search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. Always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and come spend it with us. Thanks for listening. Hey, y'all, this is Lauren Bowles. You know I play Holly, the new waitress at Merlot's on HBO's True Blood, right? All right, here's the deal. I'd rather spend all night with them damn bloodsuckers than another minute listening to that Mr. Media radio. No, thanks.